We are going to start in John 14 today. John 14. And we're picking up where we were last week. We're in the last 24 hours of Jesus' ministry. We saw the disciples and Jesus gather for a meal, specifically an early Passover meal. And the disciples don't understand everything that's about to happen. But Jesus, uh, what they know is that Jesus has been acting odd, uh, like odder than usual, because he got down to wash all of their feet. Uh, He said one of them would betray him, one of the 12, and then he singled out Judas, who just tore up out of the room after it seemed like Jesus gave him permission to betray him. And Jesus told all of them that, Very soon, they'd scatter at the first sign of trouble, which Peter did not like very much. And then Jesus said that before the rooster crows, that Peter would be the one to deny him three times. And so it it seems like a, a downer right there of a passage. And Jesus could have just left it and then gone on to what he needed to do, but he he takes a beat. Here in John 14, we see Four chapters, all of which we're going to read today. Um, Four chapters where he just really tells them, hey, this is my heart. This this is what's going to, you already know what's going to happen. But he starts off in 14 verse 1 with just one of the best verses in the darkest time of what's going to be the darkest time of the disciples' lives. He starts off with John 14, verse 1, and it's one of those things that when you are at a low, low point in your life, has anybody ever had one of those? A low point in your life where you're like, everything is dumb and I don't like it. Goodness knows I've had those a time or two. Um, This verse, this verse is so good and so powerful. John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Whose choice is it to let your hearts be troubled or not? Oh, it's ours. It's mine. I I choose whether to let my hearts be troubled at, at the darkest times in my life or whether I believe in God, whether I trust him to see me through or not. It's up to me. It's up to each and every one of us. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus treats his disciples here like they are still on that boat in the middle of a storm. And he speaks peace to them. In a very troubled, rocky time, he says, peace. Don't let your hearts be troubled. It's going to want to. You're going to instinctively want to panic and freak out. But trust the Father and trust the Son. This has all been a part of God's plan. Now think about that for just a second. Their world's about to blow up. Jesus told them it's about to get real bad. But then he says, don't be troubled about it. Don't be troubled about it. Don't worry or fear, even though you're going to react by scattering and denying. He just said that uh, last week as we looked at the previous passages. He just said all of this, it's all about to, to look as if it's going wrong. And it's going to look like, you know, your flesh has failed and and all these bad things and woe is us and woe is you and all these things. And do not lose hope, but trust in God. That goes so counter our flesh, doesn't it? To, To just don't let our hearts be troubled, but to trust in God. We have to learn how to trust God in the darkest times of our lives. At the times where we would ask God, where are you? What's your plan? That is when God says, trust him and do not worry about anything. That goes counter to everything in us that our, that our flesh would want. And when it goes counter to our flesh, flesh that's always a good sign that that is what uh, we are to be doing, the things of the spirit, the things that are opposite of the flesh. 
So true to form, the disciples have no idea what Jesus is talking about. That is par for the course. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. I love the disciples. I love, I love them so much because they're so, they're so in the flesh so much of the time. Jesus answered in, in all patience and love, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. That line in verse 9 there, Don't you know me, Philip? Even... He's saying right there, even after I've been among you all this time, don't you know me? Don't you understand? They were with Jesus. Think about what they've been through. The the long journey we've been, just as we've been reading over the life of Christ. Uh, These men were with Jesus. They sat at his table. They walked with him. They saw the miracles. But still, they struggle to know him. They struggle to understand what is happening and who Jesus is. And... I think that's sad a little bit, but I also think that's still a thing that very much happens today. People come to church and they hang out and we sing some songs and and then we open our Bibles and we still can leave having no idea of who God is. And the reason I know that is because I don't see the people doing the works that Jesus has been doing. And we mustn't misinterpret verse 14 where we think we can ask God for a mansion or a shiny new car in Jesus' name because you have to include verse 13 with it that lets us know that whatever we ask the Father will be glorified in heaven. The same as every miracle that Jesus did brought glory to the Father. But I know what you're thinking. All of that sounds hard. And that's why I love this this next part. In the midst of every storm, Jesus lets us know that if you love him, you will have help. Because how many of you know When it comes to my walk with God, I am not enough. I always seem to fall short. I always seem to need something more to get me the rest of the way in my relationship with God. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus is describing a relationship between us 
and him. One that is impossible for us to reach back and do even a fraction of our part. Think like a, a baby. Um, babies just lie there doing nothing, do no, do no part of the work. Uh, I remember when my, my kids were very little, I had to, to use a bottle to feed them. I had to take the spoon, you know, and, and put the food in their mouth. Or even I had to, uh, you know, what is the thing we do? Like, here comes the airplane or the choo-choo train or whatever, open wide. And then they just be like, eh, I don't, uh, no, thank you. You know, or the worst, you'd get a little bit in and then they'd be like, <laughs> and it'd come out. How much of that is us in our spiritual walk? I, I have been very much a part of the show before um, in ministry. I believe that you need, you know, I believed for a long time that you need gimmicks, you need illustrations. Um, I would, you know, do messes up on, on a stage and be like, you know, oh, you know, hey, uh, look at this. Uh, you know, the, I, my, my favorite thing I did was the, the Mentos in the Diet Coke. And, you know, it's like, and that's like, you know, it, it springs up in our soul, or I can make that analogy look like whatever I need to look at. And, and the kids will be like, wow, that's a mess. And they're going to be like, I remember Jesus loves you. You know, because we, we, we think we got to tie it to stuff. I believe the gospel stands on its own. 100%, I believe the gospel stands on its own. But, man, I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit, for that advocate that is patient with us that is there to help get us the rest of the way because so many of us, we feel we need that gimmick. We feel we need you know, God to treat us like toddlers or, or infants and here comes the, the airplane kind of landing for the gospel to reach our soul and that's not the case. It starts with a, a choice to not let our hearts be troubled. Going all the way back to Matthew 5 through 7, that, that passage changed me when I studied it this last year, about starts with, we are broken in spirit. We have nothing to offer, and we have to rely on God to help get us there. That's where it starts. So he sends us his spirit to reach back, to get us there the rest of the way. And God, God, in all of his love, all of his mercy, all of his grace, he sends the part of the Trinity that hovered over the deep, that spirit that we saw in the Old Testament fill kings and open the mouths of prophets, who has always been there, now lives in those who love Jesus and keep his commands. That is so comforting. We're not alone. We're not doing this by ourselves. Isn't that good? Don't you like that? Verse 22, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show us yourself to us? Why do you, in <laughs> eyes on scripture, that's why it's important. Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Anytime scripture re repeats something, he, it's really trying to make a point. Like, and he says that line again, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't, don't. The amount of times that Jesus says, do not fear, do not be afraid, use your faith, only trust, only believe. We see this all throughout the New Testament. And it, it is something that I know I struggle with. Uh, that, that being afraid, being anxious, being worried, fretting, being troubled. And God says, don't do it. If you're in him, if you're doing what he would have you do, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be troubled or anxious or, or have any of those things that the world would try to put on you. I love this, this part in this last passage about the Holy Spirit 
um, teaching you all things and reminding you of everything I've said to you. Does the word of God ever intimidate anyone? Oh, I got a bunch of theologians out here. This is awesome. You're like, no, I have the full grasp of, of the Bible. Um, I remember going into my hermeneutics class freshman year at ORU and thinking I had a pretty good understanding of the Bible, you know, because I'd read uh, I'd read the picture one through and through. I was pretty proud of that. And then I'd read a King James through and through. And I was like, okay, I think I have a, a general understanding. And then a hermeneutics professor who was a very, very good man, Dr. Vance, um, he just, he started pointing to scripture. And he'd be like, so what's this mean? Explain this to us. How does this apply to our lives? And we'd say what we'd been taught and we learned very quickly that context matters and that we had a fundamental misunderstanding of scripture in so many different things that, that I had been led to believe I misunderstood. And it was right then that I realized the depth that the Bible had to offer, that God's word had to offer. And I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I was afraid of it, but I was intimidated by it. And here's the thing. It starts off real simple, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then we get a few verses down the line and we, we start having questions. Uh, and, and we struggle sometimes to understand what it's saying. And we live in a day and age, man, where <coughs> commentary and where people can come together, we can sharpen each other, we can look after uh, other spirit-filled men and women of God who have helped parse this and help uh, come to understand it but there's also the Holy Spirit. Uh, because the amount of times that someone has come to me and has had questions about the things of God, and they've been like, well, what, is it, what does this mean, or what does that mean? And it's real easy to get, like, give an opinion, right? Well, I think, or I feel, and for me, as soon as I say that, the next thing's out of my mouth doesn't matter when it comes to the things of God. But if we can say, well, the Bible says this, the scripture says this, and we can point to those scriptures and we can say, now it's up to you whether, you, whether or not you believe. And, and then you're like, well, Josh, but I don't know the verses. Well, I'm surprised because I didn't think I knew the verses either. I've read the Bible, and I struggle with scripture memorization, but when the time came, that verse was there. The exact verse that I needed at the exact time, word of God to this other person, here you go. This is what, this is what God said. Not, not what, you know, well, God says to you. It was literally God, God has said, is saying, and will continue to say, because God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's right there. And I 100% believe that is the Holy Spirit bringing that knowledge that we, we chose to put in ourselves. We chose to take that seed, to put it in our lives. We planted it there. And then the Holy Spirit says, yep, this is the thing. This is the thing you need. This right here. It's right there for you. He brings it back to us. Um, I, I'm terrible at scripture memorization, uh, especially as I get older. Um, I used to have my brain full of facts and useless trivia and all this other stuff. Um, but now my mind is like a Teflon pan and new information hits it and it slides right off. But that's okay uh, because it's not like I'm, you know, uh, needing a bunch of new information all the time, except I kind of am. But God's word I'm able to recall because of his Holy Spirit. But we have to purpose to put eyes on it first. We have to purpose to, to put it in our hearts. And then as you love him and follow his commands, he brings it back to you for the glory of the Father. The, the amount of scripture I ever called when I needed to speak it, um, the stuff that I didn't even knew that I knew, it's always, I, and I just attribute it back to God. I'm like, God, you're so good. You... You wanted someone to know that, and so you put it on my heart and mind. The Holy Spirit will remind us of his scripture. But we got to decide to put it there in the first place and to believe it. 
So let's start by believing verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus leaves peace. He gives peace. The world cannot give that. And as the world envelops Jesus and the disciples in darkness at this time, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's something that you can only get from Jesus. Peace. Peace that lasts. Peace that is not shaken by circumstance. When we try to brush it aside by running from Jesus or denying him in word or deed, like we'll see here with Peter, it's his peace that keeps rushing back saying, don't be troubled, don't be afraid, believe. Jesus is right there. His forgiveness and grace is available to you. Believe. Nothing and no one can take that from you unless you let it. Verse 28. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. I believe it's here, as we talked about last week, um, <clears throat> I believe it's here that Jesus and his disciples begin to make their exit from the room that they were in, where the Passover feast was. I believe that's happening in the same way that we looked at uh, Luke 22 and John 13 last week where there was a simultaneous conversation while he's washing the disciples' feet. He's also talking to them about humility and about servanthood. I believe Jesus keeps talking right here as they gather their things and put their sandals on and head out the door and they turn in the direction of a nearby garden and maybe it was in the garden or they were passing by a tree and he begins to say, chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear the fruit Bear, does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word, word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And to, to make sure he's not talking in any riddles, he really lays it out for the disciples. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So we understand that Judas will be cut from the vine. He chose not to produce. He chose to separate himself from Christ. And the other branches, his disciples, they will be shaken and they will be pruned. My dad taught me how to prune a tree when I became a homeowner. He taught me a lot of things, a lot of which I did not ask him to teach, but he taught me anyway. Uh, he showed me that, <laughs> those of you who laughed, you know my dad. He showed me that branches can grow in a way that twists and rubs up against other branches. We have a tree in our backyard that has been struck by lightning twice. And... Now, if you look at it, you're like, mm, that tree ain't well. 
but it doesn't stop growing. Like this thing refuses to die. My dad comes over and he's just like, just let me, just let me put it out of its misery. And I'm like, but that's my daughter's book sitting tree. It's where she likes to sit and read the books. So until she graduates and leaves, we'll probably keep that tree. But if you looked at it right now, you'd be like, oh, that, that poor thing. Um, but the way, uh, because it's been hit, it keeps trying to, to grow in new and exciting ways. And the branches will twist and curl and bend. And more than once, one has snapped off because it can't sustain the way it's currently growing. Or a branch will grow uh, right on top of another branch and will begin to rub and cause friction and will kill another branch. And it will die and it will drop off. And so when we, we go to prune it, I've never seen someone run up to me while I'm snapping off a branch or, or sawing off a limb. I've never seen someone run up and go, stop what you're doing, you're hurting it. You're killing that poor tree. No one has ever done that because they see what's happening. They see that in order to save that tree, in order to help it to flourish and grow, this, this limb or this branch, it has to die. It has to be separated from the whole. Uh, it's the same way with us. There are times in our life when trials and tribulations come where we need to be pruned, where something we've allowed to enter our lives that has tried to take up root, that has tried to become a, a branch or a limb that should not be there, that is hurting the whole, it has to be pruned. And we have to be willing to let Christ prune it. And in order to do that, we have to let it come to the surface. And again, we see the Holy Spirit at work here. Holy Spirit pruning is not a bad thing. Our flesh thinks it is. Our flesh hates to be pruned. Our fl- what, what, do we, what have we done with sin since the garden? The first thing, our go-to move with sin is to hide it. Don't talk about it. And just let it stay buried. And if no one notices, no one notices, it'll be fine. I have this big tree in my front yard. You can see the glaring problems with my tree in the backyard. You look at it at a glance. You can be like, it's wrong. It's just wrong and it shouldn't be. Um, but the front yard has all this, these branches and the, the limbs and it, it hides all the, the limbs that are bad amongst the leaves. It's very hard to see. You have to really look to see. It's like, oh, that branch, that limb shouldn't be there. It needs to be cut off. And that's how so many of us as Christians, we like to do with our sin. We like to hide it amongst everything else. Well, look, at I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm going to church. I'm doing and saying all the right things, and I'm behaving as one should. Okay, but what about that, uh, that limb that's all messed up over there? Oh, <laughs> no, pay no mind to that over there. We have to be willing to be pruned. We have to be willing to have the hard conversations, to walk in accountability with one another, and to not get all bent out of shape when someone says, well, I'm confused about that. The Word of God says this. We line everything up with Scripture, and we go, I have questions. It seems like this is an area of your life that might need pruned. And our flesh will respond defensively, and we'll go, no, shut up. I will live my life how I want to live my life. Well, yes, that is an option, or you can live it according to Scripture, and that is a choice each and every one of us have to make. But as soon as we say, no, I'd really just rather do this, we are hiding. We are are right back there to Adam and Eve. We are hiding and we are refusing to let the Holy Spirit prune us. Uh, At a very, uh, we had moved up to Iowa, um, took place about eight or nine years ago, uh, I had fallen into a place of depression because um, we had moved up here and I, I felt lost. I felt God called us to come up here and I was angry that uh, the things just weren't working out the way I thought it would right away when I thought it would because um, <clears throat> I was looking at my timing and not God's timing. And uh, so I fall into this depression and anxiety and I have all these worries and cares. And so I turned to pornography at the time. And uh, it, it became this, I let all this, this, this one uh, problem, my distrust in God, not believing 
in what he said, I let my heart be troubled and I turned towards sin. So I, I need to be pruned, but I hid it. I hid it for so long. And I remember just having this, this time where uh, my wife and I are just hanging out or by ourselves. And I just felt that nudge in my spirit. Like God just keeps bringing this to me. He just keeps bringing it up to me. And it's him wanting to prune me. It's him wanting to let the sin come out in the open. And so I just, I confessed it. It was hard. It was very difficult. But through that, this time of healing and recovery and hanging around uh, good godly men that I allowed to speak into my life, uh, having a a wife that was gracious and compassionate, uh, who also saw what I needed, uh, we incorporated prayer, we incorporated more of the word because we should surround ourselves more with the things of God instead of, that's what sin does. Sin tells us to separate and be isolated and, and just don't tell anybody. Whereas God says, no, 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 surround yourself with the word and with the body of Christ for healing to happen. Let that Holy Spirit pruning happen. I could have kept all that bottled in and just let it destroy me from the inside, but I allowed the Holy Spirit to prune it through confession, <laughs> prayer, and the body of Christ. So let God prune you as he will. Tell your flesh to shut up and stop complaining and let God do what he needs to do to prune you so that you can remain in him so that you can produce. Verse nine, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. It's hard to do that part. And by that I mean, it's really easy when we're together, right? We're here at church. We're all in one one mind. We want the things of God. We want to worship him. We want to, we want to tell him how great he is, about how much we love him, about how thankful we are. And then we leave and we separate and we go about our own way. And, and it, we have to have that reminder, remain, remain, stay, stay with God. Stay close to his heart. Keep doing what he would have you do. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, You will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If you want a formula for Christianity. I believe it's this passage. Remain in Christ by keeping his commands and his commands are to love each other in the same way that Jesus sacrificed himself for us. That's where you find complete joy. A joy that lasts. A joy that doesn't make sense, but it's true. Whenever you are selfless, Whenever you go out of your way to help someone, um, there's joy there, right? Uh, You feel good about helping, about serving, of giving of yourself. You know why you feel that? Because in that moment, you're seeing beyond yourself and becoming like Christ, becoming the hands and feet of Jesus who constantly wants to reach out through you to sacrifice for someone else. And that sounds great. And in verse 18, Jesus tells us the world is going to hate that. Is going to hate when you're sacrificing for someone else, going to hate when you're helping and being selfless. Verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. 
If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen. And yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. If you remain in him and his words remain in you, the world is not going to understand and will hate you. But even that is not about you. They hated Jesus first, without reason, without cause. But Jesus still died for us, died for them. While we were all just like the world, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But how... Are we then to go into a world that hates us? Verse 25, again, reminding us that we're not alone. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So again, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say, And you also will have words to say about your relationship with God, about where you were before you met God, and then what happened when he got a hold of you, how it wasn't about man-made traditions or being in a certain building, but about how it was a God who became flesh and dwelt among us and gave us a chance to remain in him, and how we chose that how I want to, how I need to, and and you can do it too. You can allow me to testify to his glory and his goodness, and then you can make a choice. Chapter 16. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. After this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will all see me no more? And then after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. If you've ever been to a church service and thought, I didn't get any of that. Take comfort in the fact that the disciples are doing that with Jesus right now. Since we've looked at, started looking at John 14, they're just like, I do not get this. What are you talking about? Jesus is right there. 
given it to them. We have the ability to step back and see the whole picture. It was happening to them right then, and they're like, I have no clue. So take comfort in that. Um, but at least they were asking the questions. This is still a part of their growth, and Jesus makes them this promise that they don't get it now. And they're a little sad, but joy will come, verse 19. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, language, but I will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples says, said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. One last chapter, chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that you may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of joy, of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I'm going to read this 
one last passage here in a second, but I want to uh, I want to take a second to look at verse 17 there. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. Since last year, 2021, our family has embarked on this uh, journey called the Bible Recap. It's something we did all 2021. It's where we read a passage of Scripture every single day. Uh, we go in chronological order through Scripture starting in Genesis 1. October 1st every year is when the New Testament starts. Uh, I do not get any endorsement deals through this. I can just tell you that this is something that we are very passionate about, be it the Bible recap, be it some other devotional. Let yourself be sanctified by the Holy Spirit and his word. And his word is truth. If you're not doing a regular Bible study plan, what are you waiting for? Get into it. Let it renew your mind. Uh, let it challenge you. Let it correct you. Let it edify you. Uh, let it draw you closer to your creator. Um, if you wanted to do a Bible recap, uh, I can show you how to do it. October uh, 1st, you can, so that was yesterday. Um, but yeah, you can, you can start right there, and it's going to start walking you through uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in, in order. And guys, it's, it's so, so good. Uh, if anybody would like to do that, just hit me up and we'll make it happen. But we are called to be in the Word. We are called to be in the Word. And this next part, this last little passage that we're going to read, this next part is a prayer for you. Jesus has been praying up to this point. He's been talking directly to the disciples. But he knows it doesn't just stop with the 11 now that are with him. He knows that after those 11, there's going to be a lot more. A lot more. That uh, it's just going to grow and it's going to get out of control and it's just going to flourish and God's word is going to come alive and it's going to be good news to all mankind. In this last passage, starting in verse 20, he prays for you. Jesus prayed for you. Because he loves you, and that means something. I was, so I was studying this the other day. I couldn't get over that fact. So please put eyes on Scripture here and see what Jesus would pray over you. Verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me Loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. That prayer is so much about being in oneness together. And you look at the history of the church, the devil's tactic is to try to split us up more and more and more and more and more. Um, denominations, factions, different different branches of the same tree, but we think we have to be separate. And we have to stay in our own lanes. And you look at that prayer right there, and it's very clear, no. We are to be one. We are to be in unity, to walk in love. And I thank God that we serve a community where um, we have been able to do multiple things, where churches come together. And I thank God for that, and I pray that that continues. I really pray that this body of Christ 
in, in this place. I pray, pray that we are one with each other. That as we have grievances with one another, because guys, we're all branches, we're all limbs of this tree, and we're going to rub up against each other sometimes. We're going to create friction, and we're going to be like, ah, I don't like it. But guys, they will know we are Christians by our love. And so there is always this call towards unity. Though we might scatter and try to separate from time to time, may we remember those words that we, we looked at last week in John 13 and in Luke 22, that we would have these times where uh, we're attacked and where we, we uh, do the wrong thing, but may we come back together quickly and strengthen the body. So I would I'd encourage you to pray, for un, to pray for unity amongst this body, amongst your family. I would encourage you to get into the word. And I would encourage you next Sunday as we go into the Garden of Gethsemane, we are going to really talk about prayer. We are really going to talk about the challenge that that can be in our daily walk. Um, it's even a, a challenge sometime. I have preached probably longer than I have, and it was basically just me reading a whole bunch of scripture. It can be a challenge just to, to have scripture after scripture after scripture. That is your flesh. That is your flesh being like, church went extra long. Good! I like it when church goes extra long when we're talking about the things of God, when we're talking about being with him and drawing near to him. Let that challenge you. Let your flesh die. Let yourself be pruned. Get into the word. Get into the truth. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace.